Good afternoon and welcome to our educational webinar, Sleep Disorders in Women, Insight from the Sleep Professionals Who Diagnose and Treat Them. My name is Andrea Ramberg and I'm the Clinical Director here at Enzo Data. Uh, Dr. Andrea Matsumera attended the Long School of Medicine at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. She moved to Portland, Oregon for her residency in internal medicine and started working as a permanente physician at Kaiser Permanente Northwest in Portland, Oregon. After 12 years as a primary care doctor and hospitalist, she went back to school. Working in primary care sparked her interest in sleep medicine. While trying to manage chronic medical conditions, she quickly realized that sleep is a juggernaut for wellness. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> she attended Oregon Health and Science University as a fellow in sleep medicine and is now a partner at the Oregon Clinic in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Dr. Matsumura describes herself as a holistic sleep medicine physician and expert on sleep and women's health. She has been the guest speaker for Girls Inc., the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and numerous podcasts, and has been quoted in several articles, including the New York Times about sleep and wellness. She has served as a mentor and sponsor for students and doctors as they pursue their endeavors in medicine and beyond. Her personal passion is working and helping others end gender bias within the physician community so that there one day may be equity for all those that identify as women as they pursue their interest in leadership in medicine. Sarah Mo started her career in sleep medicine in 2006 and is the founder and CEO of Sleep Health Specialists, which provides sleep education to businesses and corporations. She was also an adjunct professor in the polysomnography program at Minneapolis College and sat on the board of directors for the Minnesota Sleep Society and the Educational Products Committee for the American Association of Sleep Technologists. For her role in sleep education in our workforce, Sarah has been named to the Minnesota Business Magazine's 35 Under 35 in 2016, Most Likely to Succeed Healthcare Division finalist in 2017, Women Who Lead in 2018, the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal's Women in Business 2019, and the Team Women's Wavemaker Award Uncharted Territory finalist 2019, and the Twin Cities Business Magazine's Female Entrepreneurs 2022. You can also catch her on her regular WCCO news segment, Health Watch, where she discusses various sleep-related topics. I'm so excited to be doing this with both of you all. Before we get started, we're gonna actually put up a poll for the audience to answer for us. Okay, so it looks like roughly the majority on the line is female. Uh, that's great. It looks like we have about 80% female and about 21%, uh, well, 79%, 21% male. Okay, so if answered female, how many hours of sleep do you get on average each night? 53%, so over half. Five to seven hours of sleep. I think I don't need to be the one to tell you that that's not that's not as ideal as what we would what we would like. Um, and hopefully some of this stuff, you know, as we're you know discussing through this of women's needs and everything, will help you know under, have the audience understand exactly what what that means. Okay. So the the topic for today is sleep disorders in women. Insight from the sleep professionals who diagnose and treat them. And something that really brought me into being interested in this is there was a women's health uh, event that we held at the hospital that I was working at. And all of it was about women's health, right? <laughs> but the number of women that would come up to me and ask about sleep for their husbands or sleep for their children or <laughs> sleep about basically everybody else in their lives, then themselves. And it would just, it really struck me as even at an event for that was meant to gear towards their health, they were still asking about everybody else in their life. And I think that that really keys into some of the unique needs of, you know, of women in sleep. Okay. So the learning objectives today is to identify the unique needs of sleep needs of women address the different hormonal and physical changes a woman goes through and how it could alter their sleep. That was something that I, shocked me when I first started learning about all this stuff, how much it really does affect sleep. Um, learn how to educate women on how these hormonal and physical changes can alter sleep and when to seek medical attention. 
discover information that will help us educate both those in the sleep field and the community on the importance of sleep, and discover whether treatment options and success rates differ for women than for men. Now, oh, women in sleep. So Dr. Matsumuro, you know, we discussed how, you know, before how women and men are different and all that, but what are some of the unique sleep needs of women that you see in your practice? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that introduction. That was, that was really nice um, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, you know, some of the unique needs for women would really be able to just make time for themselves and prioritize their uh, need for sleep. They're just like everybody else. And so a lot of times uh, I think that um, women put a lot on their plate and they normalize not getting enough sleep. So uh, if they have insomnia or middle of the night awakenings uh, or maybe stress that may be affecting their ability to uh, get consistent sleep or consolidated sleep, um, it's normalized. So then women are struggling a lot. Um, also in the um, uh, pre-menopausal state, uh, when women are menstruating, depending on where their cycle is, they might have some days of insomnia, and that really doesn't get addressed all that often. And then when women, if they decide to become pregnant, certainly there are a lot of changes depending on what stage of pregnancy that they're in, and then the post-pregnancy period, and then moving on to perimenopause and menopausal women, uh, your sleep architecture changes, meaning the, you know, how you get into different stages of sleep, your ability to uh, sleep through the night. If maybe you went at one point, you were a really good sleeper and then all of a sudden you hit perimenopause and suddenly you're not a great sleeper. There's not a lot of data or information out there to help women. I think that's really the key is that there's a lot of things that are talked about out there in magazines that are uh, advertised for women, but sleep isn't a thing that you see posted about all that often. It's it's all about what you should look like or exercise, which is good, um, but sleep is really important. It doesn't matter how much exercise you get if you're not getting enough sleep. So I'd be really interested to hear it, Sarah, um, since you work specifically with workplace, women in the workplace, I mean, my gosh, and having to, you know, having to stay up with your male, you know, colleagues uh, and not getting enough sleep, I can't even imagine. Yeah, and I love that you use the word normalize. We have normalized just being tired. Females are so incredibly adaptable. We got used to being tired all of the time that it just kind of feels like you're supposed to be, but that's absolutely not the case. And when we think about pre and post COVID world, that changed everything as well, because the studies are in women were so highly impacted socially by COVID. The vast majority of the housework and the caregiving fell on the female population. So when we think about even before three years ago, how tired females were all the time and how it just was this mentality of, you know, power through, this means we're doing a good job. This means we're doing the work, we're caring for our families. We are concerned about our communities. It's just kind of how we are. Plus, on top of that, just additionally, everything that was forced onto us through COVID, our sleep needs are now exponentially higher than they've ever been. We are fatigued, period, but now with extra work, it just really has been a, a, a tough few years that we've seen people really suffering. So it's really a perfect time to step back and say, you know what, it's not normal. It's not normal to be tired all of the time. And as you said, we are forced from a very young age to pay attention to our health in the realm of diet and exercise. This is what we've seen in magazines. This is what's forced on us through elementary school education. We are put into gym class where we play dodgeball. Uh, you know, you've learned about the food pyramid and what you put in your body, how it matters, but we're not taught about how our sleep keeps us healthy. And it's just absolutely time for that conversation. Yeah, definitely. And I think during the pandemic too, with all of us in front of our screens all day. And I think, you know, you pointed out, which I love that women often take a lot of the caretaking responsibilities, right? So even with during the pandemic, we were the ones that were juggling the kids as well as trying to work and trying to do, you know, all of that stuff. And that leads to us kind of putting ourselves last. 
Yeah, and what women have always historically done. You know, it's just it's yeah. taught from our grandmothers to our mothers to us that you know, just we're we're the caregivers, and so there's no shame or there's nothing wrong with that. It just is important to have that conversation. That, as you said before, our sleep tends to be the first thing to go when we have so much more on our plate. Yeah, and I would agree, you know, the, one of the things that uh, just came to mind was that there were a lot of articles coming out uh, during the pandemic around the um, the imbalance in what was required uh, inside the home that women were taking on. And I mean, while that was great, that was a beginning, that was a start to acknowledge that there is this imbalance in a responsibility. Uh, I would see countless women coming in, literally unraveling because they just couldn't take it. Uh, there were just too, there were too much, too, there was too much responsibility, and having to be at home if you have children, having to be home with them all of the time, and being responsible all the time really led to a lot of insomnia and anxiety and depression that just really affects people's overall general health and well-being because then it. It infiltrates in your sleep. It impairs your sleep because when we sleep, when we're going to sleep, that's when we have no distractions that the day gives us, right? So then when we're in our bed, we're just with ourselves. And that's when all of those things tend to crop up and it's real and it's impactful and we need to pay attention to it. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's a blurred line between work and home. I think home signals to us, okay, it's time. I mean, maybe not, right? If you have lots of the dishes in the sink and all of that. But but I think working from home really like exacerbated all of that because there's no line of the transition time. You know, I read a lot about how how to create that transition time for yourself after working all day, even if you're working from home, typically that would have been maybe your drive home, right? Or something like that. And so women are going right from one thing to another and they're not getting that transition time either. And, you know, you pointed out with the rise in insomnia, it's just, it's a lot for women, I think. And I, you know, we just keep bolstering through. Um, so we mentioned with the different hormonal changes, Dr. Matsumura, I would love for you to go in a little bit more detail with what hormonal changes we see in different stages of women's life. Sure, so typically when you're menstruating a few days right before your menstrual cycle starts, that is when you're gonna have some hormonal shifts that then may cause some insomnia. So it's kind of important, you know, uh, something that we don't often uh, take note of or document, but you know, if we have, premenopausal women who are coming into the sleep lab and they happen to be scheduled on a day that is right before their menstrual period. And then we all wonder, hmm, why didn't they get good sleep that night? Like what was going on? Because, you know, when you go into the sleep lab, as we all know, the way I like to describe it to folks is, you know, everybody ends up falling asleep for the most part, but, you know, good for you for getting good, I always tell my patients when I'm talking about their sleep study results, good for you for getting to sleep and sleeping pretty darn well in a weird environment with a bunch of wires all over you. Um, but yeah, so that's one thing is right before uh, menstrual cycle, uh, women will have a few days of insomnia. And then certainly um, in the perimenopausal state as we have changes, the vasodilatory changes in uh, women, tend to occur at night because there is a, a, a circadian response to some of these hormones. And so then uh, you may have a lot more hot flashes at night or you might have um, uh, changes in temperature, the dysregulation of your temperature that is occurring that can cause more insomnia or wakefulness. Or sometimes just the dip in estrogen itself will lead to uh, um, more of the uh, middle of the night awakenings. And so then uh, sometimes that becomes an alarm behavior. And then even after menopause, the person is still having issues with getting to sleep through the night. And uh, a lot of times uh, women will say, well, it was all great until I started, you know, when I hit perimenopause, it was all over. And that's because it's not often discussed and there's a, still a lot of taboo around hormone therapy. It's it, We're kind of shifting away from calling it hormone replacement therapy because we can never replace what we've lost. 
but we can treat uh, the symptoms. So it's now moving towards the phrase of hormone therapy because hormone therapy really does have a place in peri and postmenopausal women's lives uh, to help them in, with symptoms. And one of those big symptoms is insomnia, is middle of the night awakening. Yeah, and you know, and Sarah, with your work out in the community, you must get a lot of questions from women in the audience. What do you feel like? Do you feel like you're hearing a lot about women in the hormonal shifts? Are women talking about it? Oh, absolutely. And one of the, again, biggest things, especially as we come out of this pandemic, is uh, the caregiving aspect. So especially for mothers with hormonal shifts that happen, even with pregnancy, you think about uh, the caretaking aspect. So when you do reproduce, there are hormones that are then secreted to ensure that you check on the breathing of your offspring. So all of you mothers know this, when you have a child, you wake up all the time for no reason. It, and is the baby breathing? And this does start to dissipate as you reproduce more. By child number three, you know, you're know you like, they'll be fine and you don't have as many awakenings. Um, but sadly, that stays with you throughout life. So if you have three children off who are parents of their own, you will still have those awakenings because of the fact that you have offspring out in the world. So when we talk about insomnia, again, it is so common and now so much more cyclical than ever because of this in increased anxiety and stress that came with this pandemic, because we have those moments finally to ourselves in bed. And now we have this thing, have you guys heard of, it's called bedtime procrastination where you get into bed and it's your only time all day by yourself and you don't wanna give up that time. So what do we do? We throw on our Netflix, uh, we play a little Candy Crush to relax. We do all of these things to stay awake and fight that sleep because we just want to enjoy ourselves for a little bit. Uh, so we're just struggling with so much. Uh, so then we have those nights where, you know what? I stayed up watching Game of Thrones till midnight and had a glass of wine. So I had awful sleep. And then you wake up and that increases that anxiety and stress because you're sleep deprived as you get through the day. Uh, then we get through the day and we, instead of being able to, uh, so fatigued, have our head hit the pillow and fall asleep. Now we're more anxious than ever because of that cycle. So we really do, I am hearing so much when it comes to uh, that cycle and where we need to interrupt it. Uh, but it is also tough because the word insomnia has always been used for poor sleep, but it is actually the most common sleep disorder. And it is defined as difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep. So when we look at women who are saying, oh, you know, it's just insomnia, like it's no big deal. It just means I'm sleeping poorly. What we're really talking about is a classifiable sleep disorder that we are able to address if we do understand uh, that this is actually a problem and you shouldn't be just carrying on fatigue this way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, so women versus men, how they differ. Yeah, I think that a lot of what, you know, with obstructive sleep apnea and a lot of what we see in, you know, our education is geared towards men, right? A lot of the questionnaires and stuff like that are geared towards men. But it's curious, are sleep disorders more prevalent in women um, compared to men? Are certain ones more prevalent, Dr. Matsumura? Do you see a different type of sleep disorder in women than you do in men? Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, premenopausal women will have a less um, likelihood to have obstructive sleep apnea unless they have an elevated body mass index. You know, we could talk for days about body mass index and how maybe we shouldn't be <laughs> using that all the time. But if you have a body mass index of 40 or over up to 80 percent, uh, 80 to 85 percent of people without any symptoms may indeed have sleep apnea and that's men or women. They haven't really done any studies to differentiate that and in fact um, as I'm sure we'll get to uh, women just, there are very few women in most of sleep, most of the sleep apnea studies that are out there uh, right now. Um, but so that's definitely one. And then women have a uh, higher prevalence of what is called upper airway resistance syndrome. And, you know, unfortunately, that's a form, or I would call it a phenotype of sleep apnea that uh, isn't really recognized by insurance companies because simply there's just not enough data out there. But what that translates to is that treatment for it with, in a symptomatic uh, patient is often not covered. And so that's problematic because then that disproportionately affects women in society. So that's uh, one, one big area. Um, 
then the other piece we've talked uh, uh, a fair amount about is insomnia. Women just generally will show up with insomnia more so than men, um, generally speaking. That's not to say that men don't have insomnia, they do, but women disproportionately will uh, have symptoms of insomnia. And I love that you say you know, we just don't have women in the studies because that's completely historical. In fact, when we think about the research or development of the diagnosis of sleep apnea, this was done with men. Uh, and our wonderful Dr. Dement uh, very thoroughly in all of his books would describe how when they first started doing sleep studies, they put out flyers on college campuses back in the 60s looking for people who had some symptoms of what they discovered was sleep apnea. So with these symptoms, do you ever wake up short of breath? Do you ever be told that you snore? The symptoms that they put on these flyers were being answered by men. So the people who were getting diagnosed originally for sleep apnea were males, which is great, but all treatment then is now tailored and geared towards treating men. And we have to step back from that mentality because it's been so long now that we're discovering that females have different symptomology when it comes to sleep disorders. And it's the same with all medical fields. We're just a little bit behind because the research started with the male community. Same with heart attacks. In the 1960s, that's when coronary artery disease was at its peak, thanks to how uh, infiltrating the information was about smoking being okay. Everybody smoked. You know, That's when they started putting uh, sugar into all of the foods in the grocery stores. Our diet was awful. We saw this present and peak in the 60s. Then we had public service announcements saying, here are signs and symptoms of heart attacks geared towards male heart attacks. So I'm sure every single one of you have heard, here's a sign and symptom of a heart attack. Um, if you start sweating profusely, a sharp pain in your left arm, chest pain, these are mainly male symptoms. And now we have the research 40, 50 years later, we started getting the PSAs for women saying they actually present a lot more with nausea, indigestion and back pain, which Hey, that's not something that was anything that we heard of for a long time. So I think we are on our way when it comes to having these differences between males and females recognized with sleep apnea, but there just still is so much more work to do because we're such a baby when it comes to medical fields. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, so for sleep apnea, again, men, they stop breathing and their the, the typical symptoms are loud snoring you know, yeah. witnessed apneas, waking up gasping, and for women, that's just not the case. You know, they might have some snoring, but they're definitely going to downplay it. They don't, and there is data out there that states that if a female, if a woman has a male partner, that the threshold for that male partner thinking something is wrong is way different than if they have a female partner. So there's that piece, and women tend to present with more fragmentation of sleep, fatigue, just more nonspecific symptoms that we know uh, of historically uh, what defines sleep apnea because those define male sleep apnea. They don't define female sleep apnea or women's sleep apnea. So I have a very low threshold for testing women because I, I tell them, you know, we know that there are different symptoms and your symptoms are not as specific, but your risk is the same. So uh, easy enough to test. And uh, if you don't have sleep apnea, fantastic. If you do, let's do something about it. Yeah, definitely. You know, we had a great uh, audience comment. It drives this uh, attended, the attendee crazy when men with sleep apnea are described as having classic symptoms of sleep apnea and women's symptoms are almost treated like an anomaly, like that we're so different. Yeah. Yes, it is the standard is the male symptom is the, is the baseline because again, that's where all of the research began. Yeah. 1993, uh, 1993 was the first study that women were included. I say that all the time in any presentation I give. It blows my mind, I didn't realize that. Right, because it's still a shock every time I say it. It doesn't matter how many times I say it. I think, I cannot believe it wasn't until 1993 that women were included in studies around sleep apnea. We just must not have had any health issues, right? Like that's, we just, <laughs> <laughs> no, a, a really like a, a story that ties into some of that with women having more upper respiratory. So myself, I finally underwent a sleep study and the HST, I'd gone through an HST, it was negative. And this was years back. So I just thought, okay, well, 
you know, you feel tired, but it's something else, you know, it must be stress. Right. And then I had an in lab and, um, they scored me. I had a lot of upper respiratory and even then they, they wouldn't cover my a CPAP machine. So they had to rescore it with the 3% rule. And then they finally were able to, but it's just, it is. And think about as a woman, you're taking the time away, you're getting, I'm in the sleep field. So I know, and I, it's still a lot of hurdles. And it's only because we know that I push for all that. Like, well, what's my 3%? What's this? What's that? And as a treating a female, you know, patient-based demographic, they might not realize that either. So. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Matsumura, you, you know, you mentioned in your intro that you're really passionate about gender biases and solving those for, for women. What gender biases are evident in diagnosis of sleep apnea? Well, uh, so the, since the symptoms are not as specific or they're not taught uh, around women. So when we learn about sleep apnea in school or in residency, you're learning about the symptoms that are affecting men. So you're not really learning about symptoms. There's never a, a, a didactic where it says, and here's how women present with sleep apnea. That just doesn't happen. You kind of learn it on your own. So that lack of awareness is out there in the community, in the medical community, generally speaking. And so I often will have women uh, that I see uh, will say, you know, I knew I had sleep apnea, but I had to go to three different clinicians before somebody believed me that I should be getting a sleep study. So there is that, that gender bias that still exists in our community, even though, and it's simply because it's, it's just not taught. It's not taught, you thinking outside of the box sometimes. So oftentimes that's, I really think, you know, that's why women like to see other women because we don't typically, we, we're going to think about other things. Uh, and that's for anything in healthcare. Honestly, I'm just a little biased there <laughs> around that. That women women are going to ask different questions for women because they know that maybe it's not in the literature, uh, published literature, but anecdotally you learn things along the way, and then that prompts you to ask different questions for women. So within the medical community, that just you know, as we know, sleep and sleep disorders are still kind of a scratch your head kind of thing for a lot of clinicians. Um, and then um, it, within that, certainly then asking questions for women, that just, it doesn't exist really on, uh, on many levels. That specific questions surrounding sleep disorders in women, just they're far and few in between. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about insomnia a little bit, but do women suffer more from insomnia than men, Sarah? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Yep. Uh, and a lot of, again, I love the, the point, doctor, that you brought up about when a female has a male partner, what is being observed is, is much more diminished, you know, not necessarily due to lack of observational skills, uh, just doesn't maybe seem like what's happening is a big deal. Whereas, statistically, or even stereotypically, for a female partner uh, that has a male partner, we're like, um, you're not breathing, and that's a problem, and we're going to get something done about that, it's just, you know, that that difference. But as far as insomnia goes, yes, there is a higher prevalence in females just because of all of the, you know, physiological and social aspects that we had discussed earlier, but also a, a big problem with that is, again, where we just have that higher threshold for um, what we think is acceptable levels of fatigue. Uh, I'm curious, do treatment and therapy options differ for women compared to men, Dr. Matsumura? Would you look at, if you have a, a female patient versus a male patient, recommending a different form of treatment? You know, uh, there are not a whole lot of different treatments when it comes to insomnia. Now, when it comes to different sleep disorders, such as uh, sleep apnea, you know, more women are going to present with mild sleep apnea overall, generally speaking, but it may be uh, moderate or severe during their dream sleep, during REM sleep. And we don't really understand the pathophysiology behind that uh, because again, it hasn't really been studied, uh, but that lends itself to maybe trying some other treatments such as an oral appliance versus a CPAP machine. Because again, um, we'll be beating this, this drum that 
CPAP machines, CPAP masks, they're developed for men's face. They're, they're for men, they're developed for men's faces. So CPAP masks, they, they might put a pink text on it and make, maybe say it's for her or make it look all cute, put a butterfly on it, whatever. Um, it's still made for her, a guy's face. And then somebody said, oh, well, let's make it smaller. Maybe that'll work. So, you know, it's just hard. I, I tell that to a lot of women. I find that women, generally speaking, will have more trouble finding a mask that fits, an interface that fits their face because the anatomy is smaller. And uh, for the most part, the masks that are out there that are used frequently, they're just harder to fit on women. They are doing a better job of making them lighter, more malleable, uh, smaller, generally speaking, but still not really specific for women. So I will often uh, talk to women about using an oral appliance uh, when they have mild sleep apnea. Um, the other thing, there's a stigma around it, right? It's just not blinged out like glasses. Like you have beautiful glasses on today, Sarah, right? And they're, they're a fashion statement, right? Eyeglasses are a fashion statement. Well, yeah. a, C a CPAP mask is not a fashion statement. <laughs> so we haven't made it cool to use it yet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, is Sarah, does like the treatment success differ for women compared to men? Do you see women being more successful, less successful in treatment? Is there anything that you've noticed? Well, that's, that's kind of, a, <laughs> it's a loaded question. There are so many factors. Uh, so I would like to say that treatment tends to be more effective for women just because and again, this is a very broad statement, but just what we see in lab, you know, think about your male patients versus your female patients. And that whole joke of, oh gosh, when my husband has a cold, the whole world shuts down and they're such babies. And, you know, you do hear a lot of that. Um, so we kind of see that as far as compliance goes with treatment. You know, women, we, we're, if you tell us we have to wear something, we're gonna wear it. That's, you know, I showed up, I paid my money, my insurance got involved. I will do what I need to do to ensure that my health remains as, as high as they can, uh, where of course men do that as well, but a lot of times they have to be <laughs> coerced or somebody else is involved in, in having a, a treatment plan be stuck to. Uh, so I wouldn't say necessarily just females versus males that treatment is more effective. I think there are a lot of factors that go into the conversation in every specific household, uh, but I do like that there are more options coming out besides CPAP, because again, you know, the CPAPs were designed for a male face. Uh, if it's not going to be effective for a female and we go down a different path for say an oral appliance uh, or a lot of these other uh, new devices coming out, females do seem to be more willing to try whatever the next step will be in order to have successful treatment. Yeah, that's true. And you know, we try to demystify it, right? I mean, one of the things that I love to tell people is that I'm just prescribing the air. I'm just prescribing room air. That's pretty much the easiest thing I could ever prescribe for somebody. So, you know, I try to, I, I think education has a lot to do with it as well. Uh, but yes, generally speaking, women tend to be more compliant. Um, and they also are listening, you know, to uh, the cardiovascular and neurocognitive risk that may occur in the setting of untreated or undertreated sleep apnea. So, uh, you know, it's fun. I love my female patients. I think, you know, I have a lot of fun um, helping people feel better because that's really, you know, sleep is so key that if people treat their sleep apnea, their quality of sleep goes up and all of a sudden things are just a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So addressing the needs of women, what can we do? You know, if any women are in the audience that maybe aren't familiar, when should women seek medical attention to address their sleep health, Dr. Matsumira? You know, I think the minute you start having symptoms that are are different from the norm, um, instead of normalizing them, as we've discussed, instead of just kind of thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't have time for that, really prioritizing your health uh, and making sure that if you've got symptoms where suddenly you're having fragmentation of sleep, suddenly you're having middle of the night awakenings or having trouble getting to sleep, that that's not normal. And we can do something about it. We can treat it. Um, something also that, you know, when women, women are so fixated, I think, because of our, of the, the 
social media aspect that we've been fed uh, even before all the social media came out in magazines, television, all that kind of stuff uh, around your um, weight, what you should be eating. If, if women are having trouble losing weight, that's a reason to actually think about, well, how's my sleep? What's going on with my sleep? What's, what's happening? It's not, there's not a lot of screening that takes place for women. I mean, as we briefly mentioned, screening tools are really geared for men and their symptoms. I mean, there's even, what is it, the stop bang question that asks what your gender is. Well, why am I ever going to use that questionnaire for a woman if one entire question rules you in or rules you out? Yeah. Like, we should stop using that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I love that you bring up the social media aspect because there is this that quote that um, comparison is the thief of joy. So when we see all of these people out there doing it all, it makes you think, okay, well, there are enough hours in the day for me to do it all. And if there aren't, then I'm doing something wrong. So where do I start? Wake up yep. early, make sure I uh, decorate the house and put the elf on the shelf and go to bed later and make sure I am getting my Pinterest pictures, put it... And that's just so unnecessary. And I'm really hoping that we continue with that mind shift after this pandemic that, you know, we don't have to wear the fancy clothes. We don't have to put the elf on the shelf. We have to care for ourselves because this is the first time in all of our lifetimes that our health and wellness has been forced to the forefront of our minds every single day. These last three, three years, we've all had to say, am I going to remain healthy? Am I going to get sick? Are my loved ones this uncertainty as far as our well-being just wasn't wasn't a thing before so I'm really hoping that with this mindset shift uh, that we continue down this path as far as sleep education goes uh, because it's been talked about enough you know we've got the the books out there the why we sleep we've got the um, the football players saying oh I've got a CPAC you know people are finally talking about it enough to say all right well let's really integrate this into the education of our society because this is as you said doctor a really great way to help people feel better and that's why we all work in sleep medicine yeah definitely um what are the risks of untreated sleep apnea for women I mean I you know I know we talked about women versus men but what are what are the risks for untreated sleep apnea Dr. Matsumura for women same. So, you know, the cardiovascular risk, neurocognitive issues, so heart attacks, strokes, memory loss, uh, dementia. I mean, there are, you know, if you have untreated sleep apnea and you're not getting into the right stages of sleep and your brain can't kind of, the what, what I, how I describe it to patients is, you know, you accumulate all these waste products in your brain. And if your brain cannot get into the right stages of sleep, then it can't clean all those waste products out, which then translates to having all of the, this and um, the uh, neurocognitive decline and uh, it's reversible. So that's great. Like even if you didn't treat your sleep apnea initially and then you come back and say, okay, I can't do this anymore, you get better. So that's, that's the nice thing is that damage isn't typically permanent. So that's, that's great. Um, but yes, the same risk applies, you know, heart attacks, strokes, memory loss, Yes, and we obviously are incredibly concerned with the physiological aspect of that, but there's also a social aspect that's dangerous, especially when it comes to uh, getting back to operating in everyday life and operating vehicles, sleep deprivation, untreated sleep disorders in general. Well, over 6,000 people die, have fatalities in car crashes due to fatigue, and they're estimating that number is doubled because of self-report. We don't have a way to uh, kind of determine if there is fatigue, a, a breathalyzer for fatigue, as you will. Um, even relationships wise, the untreated sleep disorders cause the downfalls of many households because when we try to do everything uh, kind of in a, a level of not our best, we see people getting more arguments or having relationship troubles or things like that. There are so many physiological and social aspects that come with untreated sleep disorders that, again, it's just a conversation that needs to be had more because, as you said before, you're not supposed to be tired all the time. And if you are, we can do something about it. Yes, I always love it when people tell me that, oh, I can drink coffee and go right to sleep. And I always say, no, you just proved that you're chronically sleep deprived. That doesn't mean that you're immune to caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Dr. Matsumura, you mentioned that you don't like the stop bang for screening women. Is there anything that you would recommend for screening women, you know, now? You know, uh, I mean, the FRCP score is quite subjective, uh, but when I start, I use that more often, but there is one uh, screening tool and I haven't really done the research on it, but actually the person who invented it sent me an email about it, that it's a screening tool that's specific for women. And okay. so, there, and I'm thinking, you know, wouldn't that be great if like the three of us here got together and developed a screening tool for women and start just testing it out just to see it, what the, you know, how accurate it is, you know, because that's what we need, right? We need good, accurate screening tools that have a high pretest probability of being accurate, right? But so, I mean, there's there's not really any screening that's specific to women. There's other screening tools that have been, that are out there, but none of them have really been designed specifically for women. Um, so I don't really have anything great. I, I just, I kind of go with my gut and um, clearly have them fill out an, an Epworth, but then ask more questions that are specific to women such as fragmentation of sleep, feelings of fatigue, emotional liability, you know, how, you know, how are you handling everything and uh, move forward with that. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could do yeah. the equivalent of a breathalyzer for fatigue? When are we going to get one of those? Because trusting our patients and their bed partners for those, for their opinions or reports, we just, <laughs> now is the time for the technology, right? <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be that hard. And uh, as you were stating, I think, isn't it the number one reason why there are car accidents? It's not because you're texting. It's because you're having a micro sleep. You know so, what's fascinating? Years ago, I did a report with a news station. They brought me and a med student um, and a paramedic student to a sleep lab and did, uh, we had to stay all night and then did a driving test the next day. So I working in the field of sleep medicine was like, ah, this is great. This is going to open so many eyes. This is the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my career. <laughs> and it was, but it was so important because the next day I did my driving test and it was at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember I was with a, a police officer who had one of those cars with that they could control the pedals for student drivers. I fell asleep at the wheel. I don't remember any of it. I just remember thinking I did a great job, but I appeared intoxicated on the news report. But it just really is fascinating when you think about <laughs> just, <laughs> yes, how adaptable we are. And that was when he told me nine out of 10 traffic stops that I do, I think somebody who that I think is a drunk driver, they are just sleepy. Nine out of 10. Wow. That's crazy to wrap your brain around. I mean, that's kind of cool to be part of that study, though, to see it firsthand. We learn it, we know it, but then to actually feel it yourself, too. Um, you know, something that I always say, too, is like, it's not only just what methods we use to screen, but where we're screening and where all of it. It drives me nutty that we're not being screened at our OBGYN appointments. It's like, why are that's that's an appointment just for women? <laughs> you know, and it, they don't even think to to screen that. Is there any other areas that you feel like hey this is where any other medical specialties that you think women should definitely be screened at dr matsubara well i mean you know it seems like the 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 place to get that screening is with your primary care clinician right but anytime uh there is anything to do with women's health specifically yes i think that would be a great place to to get screening i can't think of anything else that specifically would single out, you know, going to a, a, a specialty more for women than men, but endocrinology would be another place that potentially uh, you'd want, or neurology, those two, um, you know, rheumatology because autoimmune disorders can affect women more so than, than men. And all of these chronic medical conditions, the management of them to some extent the ease in which you can manage them, it hinges on how much sleep you're getting in and how the quality of that sleep. And so I try to help people by putting all that together. That's kind of one of the things I do in my consults when people come to me and they have four other subspecialists that they're seeing, I often will try to put it all together and say, you know, 
all of these things that you're dealing with, this this one seems the the one that does that makes the least sense to you, but actually makes has the biggest impact, <laughs> which is is sweet because we'll I'll hear patients say, well, I was supposed to come see you eight months ago when all this other stuff went down in my health, but I put it off because you know it's sweet. <laughs> yeah, no, yes, it is sweet. <laughs> it should have been the first place because maybe you would you wouldn't have to have done all these other things. Um, so we still have to get the word out there. It's just not commonplace because uh, to Sarah's point, you know, um, people just, they, they wear it like a badge of honor, not getting enough sleep. And we live in a chronically sleep deprived society. Everybody is on empty all of the time. Yeah, uh, something that always shocked me with working within the hospital system too is the amount of education that was needed to other medical disciplines, not just the patients and not just the community, but to the other medical disciplines of you know what the importance is. Sarah, have you found that in your career as well? Absolutely. So back in the day when I was going through school for sleep, we learned that at that time, the average amount of sleep education taught in med school is, was about an hour and a half to two hours. And that sent people off into practices saying, oh, you're tired, let's look at your thyroid. Let's look at your, you know, anything but your sleep. So that is a really important place to start saying the people who are supposed to care for our overall wellness know nothing about this third of our lives. That absolutely has to change. It should be a, a much bigger conversation, not only in med school, but in any medical field or practice where you're going to be working with patients and addressing the, as the doctor says, all of these chronic illnesses because we are chronically sleep deprived and it's all connected. Yeah. And the one thing I would add to that is that anybody who is going to prescribe a sleep aid before you prescribe a sleep aid, you got to dig, dig deeper before you prescribe a sleep aid because many times patients are put on the sleep aid because it's an afterthought. You know, the patient themselves is thinking, well, I'm here. I finally got to the doctor, talked about all the things that I need to talk about. And they just asked me if there was anything else. And then, oh yeah, I'm not getting any sleep. That's right. Oh, okay. You know, so it's just not, it's not something that we, we provide enough time to discuss. So the word just still needs to get out that that it's really important and that if you're going to prescribe a sleep aid for anybody, you, you gotta you gotta think and stop before you do that and say, okay, I need to dive deeper into what the sleep issues are. Yeah, I love that. I that's all too common just to see people just place to, for a sleep aid with a band-aid and not actually getting to the root of the cause. Um, I have loved this conversation. I could talk for hours <laughs> with you both. Um, but there's a quick, you know, key takeaways from today. You know, some women with OSA do have different symptomology, underreport snoring, or present with excessive daytime sleepiness, and it's not often captured on the questionnaires. Um, women who present with typical male-associated symptoms of excessive daytime sleepiness and snoring are less likely to be evaluated and treated for OSA. Um, OSA has historically been regarded as a male disease, as we pointed out with the research and all of it, it's very male dominated. And women have been notoriously underrepresented in clinical studies, as Sarah brought up, uh, with only about 20% female representation in cohort from sleep clinics even now, right? Um, and premenopausal and postmenopausal women are not generally studied separately at all. And I think, especially when you think of pregnant women when they're pregnant too, that's the last thing we want to do when we're pregnant is to go get the study. But we know how much shifts within that. And, you know, and the stigmas that's a surrounded with it, and it's a temporary condition, but that can cause a lot of different outcomes for the, the child too. So it's a whole other thing. Um, but early diagnosis and um, treatment of OSA can really make, you know, a huge impact. And it's really, a, truly a common disorder in women with an estimated prevalence between six and 23% for modern to severe. So that there's, there's a lot to, to pay attention to with that. Okay, so QA session with the audience. We, I have some great questions queued up here as we end this, uh, end this session. Um, are women more affected with Comisa than men, Dr. Matsumura? With, what is that? With Comisa. So the comorbidity. Oh, with. Co <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
I I would say um, yes. I would say yes that they are. I'm trying to think, you know, if there's any data that I have, and I I would just say that anecdotally, yes. I I would say that in my experience, yes. But I don't have data or numbers to to say for sure. Um, another great question, Sarah. Is it true that women have a higher risk for cancer and heart disease if they work night shift? Have you come across that at all in any of your work? Yeah, yep. Uh, and the sad thing is that, again, because it's such a young field, because all of this data, this research is so new, this is not something that is uh, widely known. So I'm so glad that you brought it up. Uh, and that cancer risk comes from uh, the with the reduction of sleep time, uh, eliminating cancer fighting cells. So I believe the information currently is five and a half hours of consolidated sleep. Less than that uh, reduces those cancer fighting cells by something like 70%. So when we're looking at consolidated sleep and shift work, it's really hard when you uh, work nights, then you go home in the morning and it's against our circadian rhythms to attempt to sleep during the day. So getting that high quality consolidated sleep of, you know, that ideally eight hours is nearly impossible for most shift workers. Uh, and that's why we see that incidence of cancer um, rising in shift workers. So what I always say when people say, well, what can I do? It's my schedule. It's my shift is since you're probably not going to be able to get the quantity of sleep that you need, that eight hours, then we really have to focus on the quality. So ensure that your family units, everybody within the household knows that that is your time for sleeping. If you're only able to get six hours, get the blackout shades, get the earplugs, get the eye mask, get everything that is going to ensure that you're going to get the highest quality sleep possible. Yeah, that's true. And, and it is scary, some of that data that's coming out around um, chronic sleep deprivation. And then lots of uh, folks who are um, shift workers don't even bring it up, like, or it's not even discussed until they're really impaired. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Retzer, what is your take on the use of like an Apple Watch or all these different, you know, new screening as a screening or pre-screening device for hard to convince patients? Yeah, so, you know, I have a wearable. I love wearables and wearables, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think they help address trends. They're not quite there yet as a screening tool. And I don't know if we'll ever put diagnostic tools out there in the hands of folks because what I really think, and I'm probably biased, maybe it, 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 I'm a little less of, of an early adopter with this, but I think it just feeds into people's anxiety when they're looking at all of this data because they're really taking it um, very concretely. They're interpreting the data very concretely. And so I always caution people that, you know, like I stopped looking at the data from this Garmin watch and, you know, I, I love Garmin for a lot of the things that it does for me. Sleep is not one of them because I remember waking up one day thinking, oh, I feel so good. I had such a great sleep because I hadn't been giving myself the sleep that I needed. And then I looked at the data and it said that, you know, I had crappy sleep. I didn't have good, you know, deep sleep. And then I woke up hundreds of times and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm turning this thing off. But for somebody who doesn't know that that could be, uh, you know, that that could be inaccurate, then they really, it just really drives that that inability because of sleep for some people it's all about perception so if you perceive that you're getting good sleep you're going to feel like you're getting good sleep if you perceive that you're not ever going to get good sleep then you always wake up feeling crappy <laughs> i completely agree i tell my clients all the time take it with a grain of salt the technology is not there we don't know what stage of sleep you're in unless we have electrodes on your head so this is a guesstimate and they're pretty good guesstimates but they pick up your bed partner's motion, your pet's motion, that restlessness, it might not be you. If you only had 10% REM sleep, that's probably not even true. You know, I like that they bring awareness to the fact that sleep is a part of our health, but again, it brings that anxiety, it brings that worry with taking it so concretely when it's not even gonna be that accurate that does cause a lot of anxiety for a lot of people out there. So I say, you know, great, wear it if you're able to just, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but yeah, that's where we kind of need to stop for now. Yeah, definitely. 
I know I found myself freaking out a little bit with like, cause I was not getting enough stage three with this. I even, when I did my in lab, I compared this reading with the in lab EEG and just, and it was not accurate at all. Um, how does getting COVID-19 affect OSA? I mean, we've been through quite a lot in the last two years. Dr. Matsumura, did you see a difference with your patients after they had COVID-19? Yeah, so there's that lingering bronchospasm that can occur in patients who have um, COVID-19, and that can then affect your sleep because you may have that bronchospasm at night, and then you're waking up coughing, and then you feel like you can't breathe. And so if you're already on a CPAP machine, it could be irritating to the airway passage. You might need to increase humidification, uh, you know, maybe change the heat. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we've um, I've come across with patients uh, who have had COVID-19. Um, I don't, it doesn't, I haven't noticed that it actually increases apneas, but it just doesn't make them the CPAP as comfortable because they're dealing with that post-COVID bronchospasm, which looks and mimics, it, it, it's, it looks like asthma, you know, it's reactive airways. And so that's uncomfortable for patients. Yeah, Sarah, have you seen any difference, you know, with the public and any of that out with any differences in how they're presenting after COVID? Yeah, so um, the majority of my people are telling me that it's more access to sleep, yet lower quality. So, you know, we our commute has been eliminated or I work from home, so I'm able to take a nap. Uh, there's more chances to sleep than there ever has been before, but the ability to initiate and maintain it has been reduced. So it's this interesting dichotomy of when we'll get back to normal, we do really need to create that mentality of the new normal is caring for your sleep. No, that's great. Well, we're hitting at the top of the hour. Again, I greatly appreciate, you know, both of you coming on here. I joked around with both of them that I've had girl crushes on them forever. I've watched their careers and I think they're wonderful. I love it when women empower other women and a rising tide lifts all boats. So I love it. Thank you once again for joining us today.